For a thousand years or more, the Pacific Northwest people have depended on the sea for their source of most of their food. Around the end of March, when the spring tides are very high, the Uligans begin their spawning cycle, and the pe people prepare to harvest their year's supply of grease, which was also used to trade with the people from the interior of the province, or in, in that time in the interior of the continent. The grease trails were traveled by, I presume, hundreds and hundreds of people, and they packed this stuff on their backs in containers, in wooden containers, and cedar boxes they'd made, and they used it as a main source of trading with the people from the interior, and it was a, one of their main food supplies. They got their total fat, almost, from these Uligans. We used to call them, the white men came and called them candlefish because the Uligan was a, when you dried it, you could light the tail end and it would actually burn with a smoky, a very smoky little flame. The fish are about six to 10 inches long, the males being the biggest of the species. The females are smaller. Now these people harvested these fish in the, this is the old fashioned method. They don't use it anymore. You notice those stakes that are driven in the river. Those are hemlock stakes, sticks, driven way down into the gravel bar, three or four or five feet deep in the bar so they could hold these long funnel-shaped nets. The nets are about 80, 90, up to 100 feet long. They're about 20 to 25 feet wide at the mouth, and they taper down like a funnel to a very small bottom. The end of the net is laced shut, and uh, when the tide, this is close to the ocean, so when the tide comes in at nighttime, they would open the, open the upper stream end of the net. And as the tide came up, the fish would come with it, and they would drift up the stream and spawn, and then the tide would change, and the current would wash these little fish back down the river, and they would go into the mouth of these long nets and build up and build up by the ton. I have seen three, four ton in one of these nets at one time. Now, they did all this with dugout canoes, and there's none left now in the Bellacula system. They, they've been either worn out or they've drifted away to sea. But they were the main source of travel for these people on the whole Bellacula River system. When Alexander Mackenzie came across Canada by land in 1793, he came across the plateau country and came down into the valley. And that's how he got his transportation from the head of the valley down to the ocean. There you see where there's two or three nets hanging, or two nets hanging there, uh, both closed up. One of them is being unloaded with fish. You can just see how long it is. Mackenzie said that these people were the best canoemen he'd ever met in his lifetime. And he was a, Mackenzie had used the French voyageur to go across Canada, and he'd gone down to the Arctic Ocean down the Mackenzie River. So that was quite a, quite a compliment to the Balakula people, being tremendous canoemen. And they just had, they didn't paddle. They used stakes in the shallow water of the river and these long, thin canoes made out of a cedar tree. If you and I were to get into one of these canoes, we'd have it upside down in a minute. While I was taking this picture, an airplane landed on the river. And some of you might have heard of old Ralph Edwards, the Crusoe of Lonesome Lake. Well, that was Ralph and his tailor craft that landed that day right out in front where we were fishing, where these people were fishing. The Bella Coola people worked together in family groups. This was mostly Snow family here and, rela and relatives. There was Peter Snow and his mother, Old Lady Snow, Old Mrs. Snow, I don't remember her first name, and uh, some of the Webbers here, Tommy Wacus, Willie Schooner, most of the people were related, and they work in family groups and they catch these fish and part of the fish, the large males, the women are sorting out right now, they're picking out the large males, and these will go into buckets, and they'll take them back over to the village side, the other side of the river, and they'll put them in their smokehouses. They have a special way of taking a fine cedar stick, about 18, 20 inch, about 20 inches long, and they run it through the fish's mouth and out the gill. And the, the stick's about as big as a lead pencil, and they hang them up on sticks on racks in their smokehouses, and they put these away. They dry them and put them away for the winter. Now, of course, we use freezers. When the rest of the fish, are put in buckets and carried up this up the bank and put into this box. Now this box is about oh, six or eight feet square, made out of planks, and on the ground, they cover the ground with cedar boughs, nice clean cedar boughs, about a couple of three inches thick, and then they dump these fish in on top. Now this is a special process. 
A lot of people call these boxes stink boxes because they leave the fish there for about 10 days. We'll see a little shot of that later on. But it's quite a job. Families all work together. Children, mothers and fathers, grandfathers and grandmothers work together. And this is a bit of a preliminary time here with this group of people because I had been, uh, I'd asked the Siwalis family if I could do a documentary on them. There's Peter Snow. Peter's still there. Simon Schooner, not with us any longer. One of the old timers in the village at that time. Sort of early in the morning, I, I had, there's Mrs. Snow. That's why the light's poor. I didn't have much light to work with, and I did the best I could, but it was around 6 a.m. when I took these pictures at, in the end of March, first part of April. And here's the family. The women are gathered around the top. Now, there's the smokehouse fish all ready to go back home again. They still do it this way, although they don't use the same funnel-shaped nets. There's Flossie Weber in the middle and, and Peter Snow's wife on the left. Tommy Walkus in the background there with the hat, with the hat on. And this gal with a yellow sweater is Dinah Schooner. And Dinah a, was a minister for a while. Sort of a happy time of year. The Balakula people look forward to the Uligan. The winter's been pretty long usually. And there's no doubt that there's some of them would be, in the old days, would be running short of fish and short of oil and grease and so on. And these fish, everybody in the valley, all of the white people, and everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of the people come down there. The Indians catch all you want, and you can go down there with your bucket or your buckets and fill up and take them home. And pretty well, a lot of people in the valley, especially in the old days, used to eat three or four or five feeds of ooligans. Matter of fact, I think we ate ooligans for once a day for about four or five days until we got tired of them. It used to be a little competition on between some of the men. How many can you eat? And I remember one friend of mine, a native fellow could eat 24 at a sitting, and boy, let me tell you, that's a lot of ooligans. And the, you know, they're so rich that after you've eaten a dozen or so, all you want to do is go lay down and go to sleep. They're really rich in oil. Look at how narrow that dugout is. Tippy, you bet it's tippy. But those fellows have got wonderful balance, sense of balance. Of course, you know, they were born, raised on the river. The river was their highway. And you know, in the old, old days, the Bella Coola people used to keep the river for 50 miles clear of log jams, because they recognized that log jams were damaging to their highway. Nowadays, of course, we don't touch the log jams and it has a habit of making the river uh, not very good. It hurts the spawning grounds and so on. But the Indians were smart. They kept the river clean. It was the main part of their deal. And they took these canoes and they could pull these canoes all the way up the Bella Coola River for about 45 miles up to where Mackenzie came down over the mountain to what they called the Friendly Village at the mouth of Burnt Bridge Creek. And then above that, there was the old big village of Stewie. And they would go right to Stewie with these canoes from Bella Coola. No, no road, of course, in those days. And why walk through the bush when you could go by canoe? These men are taking the smokehouse fish back home. The village is on the east side and the pits are on the west side. I wonder why. Well, I'll tell you, you wouldn't want to have that stink box right in your backyard, not really. Of course, seagulls come in, thousands and thousands of seagulls come in and they clean up the dead fish that are lying around and the residue from the cook boxes. There's a lot of waste here goes out into the river and the seagulls are great scavengers and they really clean up the area. And by the way, and, and another thing too, at this time of the year, the Salmon fry are coming down the river from upstream, and the and the little fish eat the cooked ooligan grease, we'll see, or cooked ooligan matter, the fish. Now this is a close up of one of those funnel shaped nets, and this is the Siwalis net. The Siwalis family was working together. Margaret, which you'll see later on, was sort of the star of the show, and that's her son Andy in front, and that's her son-in-law, Peter Elliot, and then her nephew there, and Joe Siwalis, her youngest son, in the, at the end of the back end of the canoe. Andy's still going strong, and uh, Andy was a good friend of mine. He's the fellow there and right there on the left with the pale green shirt on. And Andy guided for me, grizzly guiding, for almost oh, seven or eight years. I still see Andy regularly. Quite a process. You'll notice they've got a, they section the net off in sections. There's a reason for this. 
because you can only lift so many fish at one time. That's a very special stick that Andy's got. It's a regular tree, and that's a natural bend in the tree, natural limb growing out there. They've cut it specially so it's tough, and they'll separate off of 100 to 150 pounds of these fish, enough that they can handle, work it down to the end of the net, let the water drip off a bit, and then dump it into the canoe. And Joe at the back end has to keep continually bailing water out because there's always a bit of water gets into the canoe. It's hard work. Here I've got good light. They waited until the sun came up well up before I got these pictures and it was sort of nice of them to do that. Maybe 150 pounds in that bag there. Probably a ton or two, maybe two tons in the net altogether. In the old days, before they had linen, people asked me, what did they do before they had linen? Well, you know, they used to, the people had developed a type of fiber, a type of uh, uh, stuff that they could use. It was from stinging nettles. They would take these long stinging nettles, about six, seven, eight, ten feet long. They would bury them in rotten logs and wait till the outside rotted off. And in the inside was the strong fiber, and they wove their nets out of that, or they made their nets out of that. When I first came to the Bella Coola Valley in 1951, there was still one of those old nets left, and it's sad to say it got burnt in a fire. The house burnt down and burnt the net. Now there's a canoe load. Wouldn't want to put many more in that. You imagine you add four of those men on top of that and come down that river for a quarter mile or so, where they're down to where they've got their pit. Nowadays, they do it the way it's doing done right here. We're going to see now. This is a seine net. It's an old herring seine that these people have acquired, and they put a cork line on the top and a lead line on the bottom. Very fine mesh, probably a half an inch mesh, so the fish can't get through it. And they seine these fish. Now, that's, they don't use the old funnel nets anymore. They use a seine net. There's a man who's mending a couple of holes. They've got to get rid of the holes because fish are amazing. They can, if there's a hole in the net, they'll find it and get out. So the net's got to be pretty sound. And there's a large school of hooligans just lying off the shore from where I was standing. And they knew they were there, and they stay there, and they were going upstream above these fish. And they're going, you'll see them here set their net. There was a reason for this. Some people from Bella Bella, from a village out near the coast, about 80 miles away, had come in with a seine boat. And over the centuries, the Bella Bellas and the Bella Coola, when they weren't fighting with each other, were trading with each other. And the Bella Bella people would bring in herring eggs and different other types of seafood, and they would trade with the Bella Coolers for ooligan grease and sopalali berries. And so these fellows this time were going to go out and catch a mess of ooligans, probably a ton or more, to give to their friends from Bella Bella. There's quite a bit of, nowadays, there's quite a bit of intermarrying between Bella Coola and Bella Bella people. And they communicate back and forth regularly. Okay, they've gone up the river. You see the man on the left, he's got the upper end going into the shore, going to hold onto that rope. The boat's anchored, and they're going to start setting the net out in the middle of the river, and then he'll cut a circle downstream, downstream, and try to get around these fish. Now, the net, of course, will drift with the, with the current. They want to get it out as fast as they can. Roger Talio rowing the boat. Louis Edgar throwing the net out. Roger's still there in Bella Coola. Louis's gone. Quite a long net, 150 or so feet long. Okay, they've got it all out. Now the big thing is to get to the shore as quickly as they can and to purse this net in, purse seine it in. That's why they call it purse seines, and to get it in and stop the fish from escaping. Now there's still an open gap there between the boat and the shore. So they set up a big commotion. They throw rocks and they splash the water and stuff to keep a disturbance going so that the fish will be scared and they'll stay upstream. And that's the reason they fill these, these skiffs up with rocks to make all this commotion here. Very quickly, they get the net into the beach. Look at them slap the water there. Always a few fish. Okay, they're pulling in the end. Now they've got the thing pursed in. A few minutes have gone by, not many minutes. And they've got the lead line up underneath cork lines floating and they're looking to see if they've got any sign of fish 
And really, right at this present moment, they don't see many. And all of a sudden, as they get the net in closer, it looks like we've got some. Sort of a little cheer goes up. Got lots, somebody said. And sure enough, you'll see as we get the get all the fish thrown into the middle of the bag. They're in a bag. They can't get out. Everybody's happy. The little fish stick to the net, but they can't get stuck in it. The mesh is too small. Hooligans, hooligans, and more hooligans. They caught a rock. What do you know? That happens. Now we've got a bag full, and now they'll start to brail these fish out of there with a dip net and fill up their skiffs. They had about three or four skiff loads that day, more than enough to give to their friends from Bella Bella. Everybody says, "Let's relax and have a smoke." Hooligans, this is where we're taping this here in the, about the, near the end of March, and uh, the fish will be starting to come in in Bella Coola right, right about now. I won't be home for the run, but I've got some friends that will freeze uh, oh a half a dozen ice cream pails full of hooligans and cover them with water, and they keep very well. We don't dress them, we don't gut them until we go to eat them, and we freeze them whole, and they keep just like fresh, covered with ice. When the Indians bring in these nets full of fish now, they use seine boats now. There's always two or three dozen people from the valley that like to go down and fill up their buckets for and have their fresh feet of hooligans. There's Louis Edgar, helping to unload this net. There's Wilfred Weber. Wilfred was back in the valley here the other day. He lives, I think, he lives down around Port Alice or Alert Bay. I'm not sure now, but he's a local fellow. There you are, hooligans, right up to your boot tops. Pretty big load for that little skiff, but they'd accomplished their purpose, and everybody was quite happy. Now, ten days have gone by. The Siwalas family have a tent over there on their side of the river. It's sort of a blustery day, and now comes the time of separating the oil from the fish. These people discovered many years ago that when when the fish got slightly old, and I say slightly old, uh, they've been aged for about eight or nine or ten days, that the oil separated naturally much better than it did from the fresh fish. So they're now shoveling out these aged fish into these in this bathtub, and they've got another another box close by. You'll see it here in a minute, and it's a wooden box with a tin bottom with a fire built underneath. And some people ask me, what did they do before they had tin bottoms? Well, they used big rocks, 50, 60 pound rocks, which they got real hot. And now that box is two thirds full with water, and then they dump in the hooligans, a certain amount of hooligans, until it's about oh three quarters full. And then they bring it back to the boil. I'll tell you something, folks. If you'd, if you got a cold or sinus trouble. I'll tell you how you can fix it. You just hang your nose over this box and take a real deep breath. And I'll guarantee you'll never have a cold again. Okay, we got the fish in. Stephen gives it a stir. The water's hot, but not boiling. And they're going to bring this mess of fish and water to a boil. Stir the pot a little bit, Stephen. Now he'll put the lid on, and then they'll stoke up the fire. The people use uh, driftwood that comes down the river. They go out there and they find an old cedar tree, usually cedar or anything. Matter of fact, that will burn, and they pull it up on the beach ahead of time and let it dry out partly, and then they split it up, cut it up with their power saws, and split it and use it for for uh, fuel to cook these fish. It doesn't take very long for the fish from that point to get to boil. Maybe 20 minutes or so. The water's already hot, see, so it doesn't take very long. There's Stephen's brother Albert Cy Wallace, trying to cut through a knot with an axe and a wedge in place there. Now there's the cooked product. It's finished as far as cooking is concerned. So to get the oil to separate, they put pour in gallons and gallons of ice cold water out of the river, 
and they've done that. Notice how full the box is. Now, they, as soon as the cold water hits this mass of fish, the oil begins to separate, and it comes to the top. And Stephen's very carefully ladling off this oil, or grease, it's oil here, and that's a homemade ladle that he's made. Nice job of carving very carefully scum, skims this off. We're getting close to the end of the process and they've got to get rid of all the debris. Now there's the star of our show. We called her Big Margaret, a lovely lady. Uh, uh, in a couple of three years before she died, she was given an honorary doctor's degree by Simon Fraser University. And the reason for this was that Margaret was a great help to the people who were studying the culture of the Northwest Pacific Indians and the Bella Coola people in, by, in especially. And she was great, a great person for information, for detail. I knew Margaret very well. She was a lovely person. Now the next step, after they get the oil skimmed off the top of the box, they've got to purify it. So they've got it in these aluminum buckets. And they've, you'll notice here they've got little rocks, small rocks in the fire. Dip the rock into a, water, a, so a clear bucket of water to wash the ashes off. Then drop the hot rock into the oil. Now what's it doing here? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's taking the moisture out of the oil. The oil will not keep if it's got water mixed in with it. So you see the steam coming off now. This is what you call a homemade evaporative condenser. Hot fire, full of little rocks. Wash them off in the bucket of clean water, and then pop them into the buckets of oil. And it takes a few minutes, but the oil, finally you're getting rid of all of the moisture in there. We're getting close now to the to a real finished product. See what happens. Not only does the moisture disappear, but the impurities come to the top. Like some of you women who have made jelly and stuff at home, you've got to take the impurities off after you cook it. And this is what she's doing here. Very carefully, she's skimming off the oh, little bits of fish and foam and stuff. They want to end up with a very pure, clear product. So she throws the residue into the campfire. Makes good fuel. This family would do probably 10, 20 buckets that size of grease for themselves. Now the final stage, she's got a nice clean cotton cloth in about a five gallon container. And she'll pour this oil through the cloth and it ends up a very pure product. Omega oils polyunsaturated, some of the best fat that a person could possibly consume. And you know, at this stage, there's no bad taste to this stuff or no bad smell. Uh, it's quite palatable, only you don't want to eat too much, you'll get the trots. But I know that Margaret said to me right, right about this time, she said, would you like to have lunch with us? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And she was, she was working over there by the table they had. and. Uh, I noticed a few things. She had a nice big jar of homemade plum jam, and she had a little sort of a, a stainless steel frying pan with a handle off, and she was going to cook us lunch with ooligan grease. Nowadays, they store this stuff in bottles, in gallon bottles, but in the old days, they used to store it in cedar boxes they made. It never gets real hard, even if it gets cold. It's always a sort of, it gets colored, creamy colored. Now they're very fussy people. After every cooking batch, they wash out the box. They're very careful to keep, take all the old residue out. And of course, this residue goes into the Bella Coola River. And that's one of the things I mentioned earlier that the little salmon fry coming down feed on. Now there's an ingenious method of getting water. See that nice stream of water, maybe 30, 40 pounds of pressure? Well, they don't have a, a modern water pump in they got the pump all right, but the power was from an old power saw. And they've taken off the blade and they've mounted a little pulley on the power saw and they've got a belt and, and Peter Elliot there's holding on the friction. Pretty ingenious way to pump water and lots of pressure. Wash out the box, flush all the residue into the river and then fill it up to about two thirds full to get ready for another batch. Now there your, there's your fire burning away merrily. There's Margaret working in the background, getting our lunch ready. Good hot fire on a sort of a cool spring day. And she's making, some people would call it bannock, baking powder biscuits, 
flour, water, a little baking powder, some salt. And while she was doing this, she was telling me some stories about her people. I just wish that I had been smart enough to record her voice in those days. So there's our lunch. She's deep frying. We call them Ooligan biscuits. Margaret was a great person. I miss her. And there's the Uligan biscuits being cooked on the open fire. The bottom side is nearly done. She's turning them over now, and they're nice and brown, and you know, they tasted well, good, really good. Homemade jam, fresh Uligan biscuits, fit for a king. The second fish, really, that comes into the Bella Cooler in the springtime is the spring salmon, the big fish. The kings, they call them, or Chinook, but we call them spring salmon, and they'll, they'll average 20 to 25 pounds. There's red spring and white spring, and this particular day, these people eat a lot of barbecued salmon, and they have their own special way of doing it. And Margaret, again, was in charge of this, these three women. There was Mrs. Nelson, and Mrs. Edgar, and Margaret Siwallis. And they were doing this for a special occasion, but I thought it would be interesting to show you just exactly the old-fashioned way. They've used, again, they use cedar, and they've, they've, they've fitted these fish, spl split them open, the whole salmon, these fish here would probably average about 20 to 22 pounds, a little bit of salt, not a whole lot of salt, and they've got a nice big fire in the middle, and they use alder. All of the Bellacoola people use alder for smoking ooligans and smoking all kinds of salmon. And this particular day, they're barbecuing for us, and the women had their ceremonial blankets on. When the fur traders and different people first came to the area, they had a stuff to trade with, and they traded buttons. You'll see the buttons on that. And the, so the native people uh, made a lot of their garments, early garments, with buttons decoration on them. And uh, those are fairly recently made, but not too recently. Probably those, those uh, capes were made back in the early 1900s or early 30s. There's Charlie Moody, uh, one of the men from the village in Bella Coola, just visiting over and talking to the women. You see they've got these, they've dug up the ground around there so they can stick the sticks in the soft soil. And Margaret, you see, is making sure there's enough wood. They can move, the, if the fire gets too hot, they can move the fish back or forward. Lots of wood. That's green alder they're using, but in their smokehouses at home, they use a lot of rotten alder, old alder. It, it smolders better, it smokes better. It doesn't change the flavor. Now take a look at this. This is a product that's almost finished. I can, I'm just looking forward to spring this year when we can have some barbecued spring salmon. I don't know what you'd have to pay for a barbecued spring salmon done that way in the, in the town now, but it would be plenty. But fish, of course, was the major diet for the Bella Coola people.